This episode of the Rhino Podcast is brought to you by RTM Entertainment. They are offering Chicago fans the chance to win the ultimate VIP fan experience to fly to any Chicago concert in the country. Go backstage, hang with the band, get free Chicago band swag, and all you have to do is pick up your smartphone, open your texting app, and type the word Chicago to the number 47711 and hit send. You'll get a link texted back to you and click that to enter your info and qualify to win. New winners are picked each month. U.S. residents only. Ladies and gentlemen, record geeks, retired plate spinners, and millennials who want to impress their parents with their record collections. Welcome to the Rhino Cast Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Get ready for new releases, deep tracks, and conversations with your favorite artists and bands. And balloons for the kiddies. And now, your hosts with the most, Rich Mahan and Dennis the Menace. On this episode of the Rhino Podcast, we feature part two of our conversation with Chicago, this time focusing on the band's live performances. Hey, Dennis. This is fun. This is a whole different part of Chicago that so many people probably, if they haven't gotten to see them live, they're in for this amazing revelation. Yeah, this band really is something else, quite a phenomenon. They've been doing it for 50 years, and they sound as tight and vibrant as they ever have. The two records we're talking about today are... Chicago Six Decades Live, This Is What We Do. It's a great set that features career-spanning, unreleased material from their live concerts. And there's also a DVD attached featuring a Rock Palace concert from the late 70s featuring Terry Kath. 
just fantastic tons of material on this release. Yeah, and then the sound stage is an entirely different thing because they perform Chicago to end to end. They do, and this is a recent concert. This was just filmed recently, and I think people are going to be surprised how great this band sounds live to this day. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. I mean, one of the things that's been said about the Chicago Six Decades Live, this is what we do, is that it makes a case for the band's early greatness. And I thought that was a great statement. What can you say about a band that after their first record came out, they're headlining, at that point, the world's largest pop festival, Isle of Wight. It was larger than Woodstock. It's phenomenal. They were the first on Friday night. They were the headlining act. Which most people probably don't know because they're paying more attention to all the other Woodstock acts. But that gets to an interesting point about this Chicago Decades Live release. And a perfect example is December 1st, 1977, Oak Town, California, Oakland, California. Minutes from where I'm sitting right now, December 1st, 1977, taking it uptown. I mean, rock, soul, funk, two minutes and 56 seconds in, there's this guitar solo that goes on for 30 seconds that rivals pretty much any of the greatest guitarists of our time. And you realize that in one song, you're hearing rock, you're hearing soul, you're hearing funk, and these are not the things that are always associated with Chicago. And everybody in that band brought something else to the table. And you're right, Terry Kath is certainly one of the unsung guitar heroes. There are some performances on this release by Terry that are going to seriously blow people's minds. No joke. And the other thing about Terry is he wasn't one to follow style. If you watch on the DVD, I mean, he was wearing a floppy cap and a hockey jersey. He wasn't wearing the flowing robes of the era. <laughs> yeah, he really just kind of led his guitar playing and his singing. He was quite a singer. Speak for themselves. The other thing that the Decades Live, this is what we do release captures is this is a band literally on the threshold of their commercial success they didn't know how big they were about to become but they knew that something was coming and they've gone on from then of course they've won multiple grammy awards two of the members are in the songwriters hall of fame their first album is in the grammy hall of fame the second album chicago 2 which is featured live on soundstage is also up for consideration to be included in the grammy hall of fame for people who kind of like a little bit of a musicological puzzle, they can compare the performances of 25 or 6 to 4 from Paris and from Isle of Wight. And when you put them together, what you realize about Chicago as a band is their accuracy, their prowess, but you also realize that within something as tight a song as that, that Measure for measure, they still riff incredibly and still make it the hit that it was. Super tight band, yet played with a passion and their improvised sections. It's arguable that there wasn't another band back then that could do what they did. That medley of In the Midnight Hour, Knock on Wood, I'm a Man. Again, this is a band who took the classics and brought them into today. There's, there's no doubt that even when Chicago did covers like these iconic Eddie Floyd, Wilson Pickett, Spencer Davis, that they made them their own. And it takes a very special band to take songs that are as iconic as these and transform them. And you mentioned the DVD. The DVD that comes with Chicago's Six Decades Live, This Is What We Do, in addition to the Germany Rock Palace TV series, there's this Dick Clark special called Chicago in the Rockies that shows an entirely different side of the band. Maybe the Rockies affected them for all I know. 
Well, absolutely. After all, their manager, he built Caribou Studios in the Rockies, which was, you know, so many classic records were recorded there in the 70s. But basically, that was Chicago's home base. Well, let's get to the interviews. This time around, let's start with Lee Lochnane. Well, Lee, thanks very much for joining us for the RhinoCast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You guys play so much. I mean, you've been on the road constantly now for 50 years. There's so <laughs> many bands that don't even last five years. I know. We thought we would be one of those. Uh, you know, everybody does. Why would we be any different than anybody else? You never know. I mean, it, it just turned out this way. You know, we had no idea, but now it feels like we can go on until we, you know, collapse on stage or something. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> At least well, not tonight. Eventually, you know, how long are we going to go? Right? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> but one of the things that amazes me watching the soundstage performance is you guys have been playing for so long. How does it not become commonplace? And how do you give such great performances still after doing these songs so many times? Where, where do you find your inspiration? Well, they're not easy songs to play. And you, you have to keep your chops up. So a lot of practice after the show, before the next one, to be able to pull it off. And because it's obvious to me, whether it is to the audience or not, if I'm not ready. So I try to make it sound like we're doing it for the first time. And I think that's the general opinion of everybody in the band, their general feeling. It shows because it's a vibrant performance. You're definitely not phoning it in. Right. It feels good. And, and I'm telling you, these songs are not easy. you got to dig in. That's what I'm saying. I mean, to relearn some of these songs that you hadn't played in so long, it must have, uh, almost like discovering them again yourself. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of great professional musicians have come up to us and me and said that they appreciate what we have done and it made them get into the business and they play rings around me. So for them to say that the stuff that we do is challenging is more credit than I gave it. It's quite a compliment. Initially, because I thought what they were doing is far and away better than us, and not necessarily the case. You guys were on the road constantly, so coming up with the new material and rehearsing it before you even got into the studio to record, where did you find time to do that? I don't know. I really don't. It all seemed to come together. I think we did more rehearsing in the studio than on the road. Instead of rehearsing, we actually just played the songs in front of an audience. Oh, to, you just go to for see it. how it worked, yeah. And then we'd go into the studio and record it. And then after the studio, the song was still developing on the road afterwards. So it was like a continual improvement. So in that sense, the soundstage DVD that is out now mm -hmm. gives you a chance to get another version of it down on tape, so to speak, maybe with those changes and the fine nuances, adjustments that you made after the original studio recording. Exactly. And of course, your Chicago Decades Live has several versions of these songs on it as well. So it's really interesting to hear it. Sometimes they sound so different at the beginning to me that I don't realize that it's the same song. You know, I've been in stores where some of, uh, like, a, a song is playing and I go, that sounds really good. I wonder what that is. And then I realized that it's us. <laughs> and I went, that sounds better than I ever gave it credit for when it first came out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. You get away from it for a little bit. You're not quite as... Uh, Picky. Yes. As it were. The forest for the trees kind of thing. Yeah, the attempt at perfection that yeah. never happens. You're obviously a great trumpet player, but you'll bring a lot more to the band than that. And now, currently, you sing Color My World on tour. I do. What's that like for you every night? I backed into it somehow because we decided to try to recreate a bunch of the hits. I think it was for advertising. They wanted to use these songs to see if they could get commercials and stuff. So we recorded a bunch of songs and it became the Nashville Sessions. We did Make Me Smile and Color My World and a few of the guys had gone in to sing the lead vocals and I said, you know what? Give me a shot at it. You'll know within like one bar, a hit or a miss. You know, right. pull me out, drag me out by my neck and, and it'll be over. But I sounded texturally closer to Terry than anybody else in the band. So I tried to recreate, impossibly recreate Terry's vocal. A little bit of his vibe. <laughs> yeah. We'd listen to the licks and then I'd sing it. And then we'd listen to the licks and I'd sing it. So it came out sounding um, pretty good. Recently, a documentary came out, Chicago, Now More Than Ever. How did that look back impact you? Peter Pardini directed that. And I just said, try to put people who have been responsible for our career 
in front of the camera and a microphone and ask them what they thought of us during that period. Put the memory of that period in their head and let them speak. And the audience will decide what's true and what's not. We had nothing to do with trying to rewrite it, as some people have said, afterwards. It was like, are you kidding me? Did you watch the movie? I didn't get that vibe. Yeah, some people did. I don't think the movie shows that at all. I, I enjoyed what it showed because it was a true representation of our lives. I loved all the footage of you guys out at the Caribou. I mean, <laughs> some crazy times. Great man. footage. You know, this isn't on any of these releases, but I found a video of you guys playing with Al Green. Oh at God, Caribou. yeah. What was that session like? That was great. It, it was so much fun because he was surprised that we learned the song so quickly. I mean, tired of being alone wasn't that difficult to song. Yeah, to learn. But the groove is undeniable on that one. Yeah. When you guys recorded in the old days, when you recorded in Chicago too, when you record now, do you still try to get everybody at the same time? Yeah. Capture that live performance? If you can, yeah. Yeah. But if something, you know, there's the train wreck, you got to fix it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, looking back, especially with the new Chicago Six Decades Live, what on here song-wise on this collection was a surprise to you and a revelation to listen to again? Now, Jeff Maggot produced it, but a lot of the engineering for Isle White, Goodbye, a bunch of the songs came from my studio in Sedona, Arizona. Tim Jessup did all those. Well, Tim did a fantastic job. That's what I'm telling you. He did a great job. Yeah. Lee, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate you sitting down and uh, talking about these great releases. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. That was so cool to hear from Lee Lochnane to hear the Al Green story and how even the Reverend thought that they did a great version of his song. And, and Al Green's not, a, not an easy guy. I mean, he's an easygoing guy, but I mean, he, he's not going to mess around in terms of saying how somebody, you know, how he feels about somebody's cover of his song. Absolutely. And I think that just speaks to what you said earlier about how great they were at reinterpreting other people's music and playing it with an authenticity that was undeniable. Now here's a word from Chicago themselves. Hi, welcome to the show. We hope you're having as much fun as we are. We wanted to tell you that we're going to have a new contest. Now you could be a part of the legacy too. Text the word Chicago to 47711. Yes, and you will win $1,000 you may use to fly to any city where we're playing this year. Premium tickets to our show, backstage passes, get to hang out with the band, take photos, a little bit of swag, <laughs> maybe a little refreshment. It'll be a lot of fun. Text the word Chicago to 47711. Rich, I am already learning. I thought I was a relative Chicago archivist, but I'm already learning so much just from that first conversation and there's two more to go you're about to talk to robert lamb yeah let's get to that one so tell me about the current tour you guys are playing the album in its entirety are you playing some hits as well we are playing many hits about an hour's worth of hits the performance is about two hours long we spend an hour doing the chicago two and an hour playing not every single big hit, but you know as many as we can squeeze in. Generally speaking, the audience finds the Chicago too, especially the first four songs, interesting, challenging. You know, once in a while, I remember a lady yelled out, "When are you gonna play something I know?" You know, because <laughs> there are a lot of people that don't know. Sure. Chicago too. Yeah. That uh that are coming to our concerts. Maybe it'll turn some people on to deep dive into the record that they weren't familiar with previously, hopefully. I, I think it's worth listening to. The music is challenging and quite unusual, even for this day. I would say especially these days, you know, records sound very different. You know, pop records, there's very little guitar. Right. A lot of kick drum, a lot of loops and samples yeah. and things. But in that way, the Chicago 2 album, especially the, the first side, sound pretty fresh. And I, I hope people take it like that. You filmed the soundstage performance in Chicago, your namesake town. Yes, we did. Do you still feel something special when you play in Chicago? Or have you played so many places now that you put on the same performance everywhere? Well, we try to put on the same performance everywhere, but some performances I'm 
sort of more self-conscious than others. I would imagine certainly when you're filming for something like this, you think about the gig a little differently than a regular gig. Yeah, although I have a bad habit of thinking in terms of, well, if we, if we blow this take, there'll be another take, that kind of thing. So right. I try hard to play well, and if it doesn't happen, I'm, you know, we can fix it in the mix. Chicago Six Decades Live. This is a wonderful package. The artwork is fantastic. There's a pullout book with great liner notes. Mm. Kind of the gem for me in this package is the audio from your Isle of Wight performance. What was it like to play that festival? You were a headliner along with The Doors on Another Night and mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. on the third night. Yeah, it was definitely a thrill. We had played pop festivals in 1969, so we knew what the environment was going to be. What we didn't know, what we know now, the sound reinforcement was fairly primitive. So it was all about playing loud. Because there was a larger but, crowd there than Woodstock. That's a situation when you walk on stage, your heart beats a little bit faster, just the sheer numbers of people in the crowd and the general vibe of it. Well, you were so well received. If you listen to the end, after you played 25 or 6 to 4, the crowd, it's not just polite response. They're going nuts and wanting you to come back and do your encore. I mean, they, the crowd exploded after that. Yeah. You guys knocked that one out of the park. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. It was, it was one of those things that happens if all your receptors aren't working, it flies by and you really don't know what happened. Right. You know, but you know you were there. And that's about it. Many musicians now, of course, use in-ear monitors, especially on a, yeah. a professional touring level. Sure. Has that helped keep your vocals in tune, keep the band playing more cohesively? Yeah, I'm sure of it. And I'm sure that it's also preserved my ability to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've lost some. But I will say that for at least two decades, even before decent onstage monitors, before in-ear monitors, I was always tuning to what I heard in the house. So I never really had a problem with tuning. I would have more problems singing the studio in tune, yeah. you know, because it was so exacting. Well, back in the day, you played a B3. Do you ever miss playing a B3? Yeah, I do. On stage? I do. I will say that basically I am a piano player. I would prefer to be playing a grand piano and a Fender Rhodes and a B3 on stage, mm -hmm. but I do it all in one digital keyboard. The band is so tight. Your vocals sound exactly like they do on the record. It's so impressive. How do you keep up that vibrant energy on stage after doing it for 50 years? Well, the answer is easy. The music requires it. If we were trying to phone it in, it would be awful. So the music requires that you focus, that you listen to the other players in the band, and that you don't hold back or you don't let down ever, because the music just won't happen. Well, Robert, thank you so much. Rich, it's kind of amazing what Robert talked about, which blows me away, is being able to keep up that level of energy after 50 years. I mean, we should be so lucky as to have that kind of powerful voice after 50 years. I mean, I can't even imagine how many shows. Anybody who sees this band live, especially this summer, because they are playing Chicago 2 in its entirety, that's going to be one of the things that they take away from the concert. This band sounds fantastic live. The vocals, their harmonies are spot on. Sounds like you're listening to the record. I mean, it's really impressive. And the way that the crowd responds to their music to this day is a testament to the passion that this band puts into their music and their live shows. And you're about to take it up to one more level. You know, what's kind of funny is Chicago had how many numbered albums? Well. We're about to go to part three with James Pankow. James, what has the response been to you guys playing Chicago 2 live on this summer tour? We kind of rolled the dice when we decided to do a performance of this entire album. Not only from a performance standpoint, because it... Again, it's challenging music. I can't goof around on stage as much as I'm typically inclined to do because I'm too busy paying attention. <laughs> if you get lost, you're screwed, yeah, you know. Yeah. But we are very pleased that the audience, both young and old, people that have never heard this stuff, are responding to it very positively because it's the real deal. Chicago Six Decades Live is the new set that's out now that has 
the Isle of Wight performance from 1970. You guys were headliners along with The Doors and Jimi Hendrix. Oh, yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. It also has a Rock Palace performance on DVD from 1977, which is a super fun thing to watch. And it has, on the third disc, a performance from Paris in 1969 that I find really intriguing. Liberation. Terry absolutely tears that song a new one on this recording. There's so much passion in that performance. Liberation, yes. which is part of this live performance at the Olympia in Paris. Liberation was written by me when I was performing in Chicago with a jazz quintet. Well, we were performing that in clubs. It was an instrumental and it was a step out for Terry Kath as one of the members of the band. We were on stage at a club in the Midwest in Madison, Wisconsin called DJs. It was right off the campus of the University of Wisconsin and Otis Redding and the Barquets were flying in to perform at the arena at the University of Wisconsin the night we were on stage at DJs. Their plane crashed and all of a sudden hundreds and hundreds of kids with tickets for that show came into the club and we found out what had happened and we had done a bunch of Otis Redding songs in our club set and when we learned of his plane crash and his demise Liberation spontaneously became a tribute with the Amen cadence in it. We, on the spot, stretched it out and performed it as a tribute and a eulogy Wow! to Otis Redding. And that performance on this disc is the embodiment of that posthumous tribute to the great Otis Redding. How random that you guys were there in Madison on that evening. Yes. That's uncanny. It's unbelievable. Well, let's listen to a bit of Liberation from Olympia Hall in Paris, France on December 8th, 1969, featuring Terry Kath on lead guitar. Tell us how you guys came to open for Jimi Hendrix on tour. First of all, the Hendrix tour was a blessing beyond words because we had no record. We were the opening act for Albert King at the Whiskey on Sunset Strip. and we were Another guitar slouch. Yeah, right? <laughs> and we were ready to go back on. And as we went to leave the dressing room, Hendrix was standing in the doorway. And we were awestruck. And he looked at us and said, you guys got a horn section that sounds like it has one set of lungs and a guitar player that's better than I am. You guys want to go on the road? <laughs> Hell yeah. Right. And we were his opening act for a whole touring season. And it was amazing. We'd be on stage and we'd hear, we want Jimmy. We want Jimmy. And we'd just say, hey, shut up and listen. Yeah. And they did. And Hendrix totally got it. You know, he was thrilled to have us on tour with him because he got it. You know, he knew what we were all about. He was blown away by this stuff. And the fact that he was so insistent upon 
us being a part of what he was doing. That was big validation. And also national exposure that was priceless. It got the word out about our music all over the country before we ever got in the studio. And were you signed at that point? We or no, absolutely. The signing happened after the tour. No, there was no record deal at that point. We were an up and coming new act. You know, so you who are these guys? So you that also helped you get signed. That oh, visibility. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it, it uh, most definitely made record labels take notice. If Hendrix got it, you know, there must be something here. Right. We should check this out. Right. So when we finished the Hendrix tour and went back to L.A. and continued our run as kind of the house band at the Whiskey. Labels started coming in and checking this out, yeah. and well, we wound up cementing a deal with Columbia. After playing for 50 years, everything that you guys have been through, the band still sounds fantastic as evidenced on the soundstage recording that's out now, and the collector's edition has all of this great music on it. What would you say to somebody that really hasn't been exposed to Chicago? Maybe they're young or they just missed it somehow. In your mind, what's the best place for them to start? You know, anybody that would come to a Chicago show is going to hear A to Z. We are still trying to embody the essence of what the band is in performance. So a new listener who comes into the fold, which, by the way, still happens, that really blows me away that kids hear this today, 50 years into this career, and they discover it through their parents or whoever. There's something that strikes a chord in them, and it brings them into the fold. They are going to hear the songs that represent the formative years, the songs that are the nuts and bolts of the musical approach of this band, and they're going to hear music we are still trying to approach that captures where we are now, you know, the evolution, because we have evolved over all these years and continue to musically. Chicago 2 is an album that has elements of all of that. It has songs that are very challenging in their construction musically. There were time changes, the key changes, multiple vocalists, horn arrangements that are very untypical, that have jazz, blues, have intricacies involved that would challenge any modern horn section. And then it has guttural things that are very digestible instantly that are just good time rock and roll and songs that are now huge hits. So the performance of the second album, which is the first half of our show this year, is the A to Z of what we are musically. So young and old who come to Chicago to experience this band will hear it all. And again, this package that Rhino has amazingly captured both sonically and visually is the real deal and it's an amazing embodiment of what this band is a to z man i'm impressed
Howdy, buckaroos. Circle the wagons and sound the alarm. It's time for the Rhino Roundup. This is Lauren G. And John Hughes. We're here with the Rhino Roundup talking about our summer campaign, Back to the 80s. And we've got a guest with us today from our stellar business affairs department, yes. Dana Jacques. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, you're here because you and I have a lot in common in terms of musical taste. We do, which we found out just randomly, I think. Right. Just walking around the office. Yeah. Uh, we love the 80s. And this summer, as part of Rhino's 40th anniversary, we're having a Back to the 80s summer campaign in focus and lots of stuff coming out on vinyl that's just amazing. Why don't you tell us about two of your favorites? Well, I'm really excited about Madonna's Like a Virgin. I mean, that's just seminal. It's a seminal album. But the interesting thing about that album is that even though, you know, we've got Nile Rodgers producing on it, we've got great lyrics, memorable videos, which are the ones that I think that everyone remembers. But mm -hmm. the thing that I like the most is that there are a couple of songs on here that I don't think people really tap into. Angel is actually one of my favorites. It, underrated single. Very underrated Because there single. was no video. That's why people forget about it. Exactly. Exactly. And also her rendition of Love Don't Live Here Anymore by Rose Royce. <laughs> I mean, who else is singing it that way? And it actually is a really good production. You've got violin. Mm -hmm. orchestration in the back. Like a virgin, you're going to get you're, you're gonna get your pop, you're going to get you know, get into the groove. Yeah, I think people think uh, Love Don't Live Here Anymore is from Songs to Remember. Remember? We, right, that's yeah. what I always assumed exactly. it was. And I forgot, I was like, wait a second, this was on uh, mm -hmm. Like a Virgin. So this is a great album, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the time Ice Cream Castles. Let's get into it. Back on vinyl with Neapolitan Swirl Vinyl, which I think is amazing. because it's gonna That be, sounds amazing. That's going to yeah. look delicious. Yeah, I know. You, <laughs> you have to play it, not eat it. Can we just oe oh, 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 Just once. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's part of the thing. You have to do it. Yeah, well, because everybody's focused on Jungle Love and the Bird, but Ice Cream Castle's got has great songs. First of all, Chili Sauce at the end. That's hysterical. Absolutely. It's the end of side one, I think. Yeah. And uh, the title track, which actually I remember that video being on MTV a lot back in the day. And it wasn't a hit, though. That's it's a good crazy. song. I mean, but it's, it's like song. straight up Prince time. I mean, it's your classic seminal stuff. Jamie Starr. Absolutely. It was produced by Jamie Absolutely. Starr. Let's get that right. You're right, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jamie Starr, we can't call him Prince. The artist formerly known as Jamie Starr. Right, you know, but it's just, it's a great to have that back on vinyl again in a really cool collector's edition. I'm here for the Punk Nuggets and the New Wave hits myself. Oh, yeah. Punk Nuggets is television, the Ramones, Dead Boys, Pretenders, Johnny Thunders, Gang of Four, New Wave hits, you got... Kaja Goo Goo. Oh, hey. You got Aha, uh -huh, mm -hmm. Joy Division, Tuck Tuck, The Cars. Dana. It's all good. Talk Come talk. on. <laughs> talk, talk. No, listen, you it's, you basically have everything here. It's a good representation of all of that era. I like Talk Talk myself. Mm -hmm. I, is there another band that has two names? Duran Duran? <laughs> that has, but but that also has a song named that you mean has a Talk song. Talk, the single from Talk Talk <laughs> from the <laughs> album <laughs> The Party's that's Over. Right. <laughs> that's where, that's where that's they where it could, ends. Yeah, that's where it ends, unfortunately. <laughs> um, well, and that's where this is going to have to end, and we look forward to all this stuff in our Back to the 80s summer campaign, and that's the Rhino Roundup. Thanks for tuning in to this Chicago Live episode of the Rhino Podcast. Rich, I've got my dose of rock, soul, funk, pop, and who would know it would all come from Chicago? Don't forget jazz and classical, because that's in there too. Exactly. I recommend for the people that really want to deep dive into this, you go get the physical product because it has the DVDs and you can watch these live performances that are really fantastic. If you want to learn more about these releases, please visit rhino.com. And of course, the music is available at your favorite streaming outlet as well. And last but certainly not least, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next RhinoCast. Executive producers for Rhino, John Hughes and Lauren Goldberg. Produced for Rhino by Pop Cult and Rich Mayhan Promotions. All rights reserved. This episode of the Rhino Podcast is brought to you by RTM Entertainment. 
they are offering Chicago fans the chance to win the ultimate VIP fan experience to fly to any Chicago concert in the country. Go backstage, hang with the band, get free Chicago band swag, and all you have to do is pick up your smartphone, open your texting app, and type the word Chicago to the number 47711 and hit send. You'll get a link texted back to you and click that to enter your info and qualify to win. New winners are picked each month. U.S. residents only. 